So I'm, I'm very pleased to host Professor Ellen Ryloff from the University of Utah today, and she's going to talk about some work that she's done on automatically inducing what are called plot units from narrative text. This is based on some very early work by uh, Wendy Leonard, where she tried to uh, develop story understanding systems that could um, categorize events in terms of how they affected the participants. And Ellen's work is the first work to actually try to do this without a massive amount of handcrafting in a, you know, kind of trying to get past the AI completeness of the problem of encoding emotional state change for characters in, in narrative. She, um, she finished her bachelor's degree at Carnegie Mellon in 1987 in applied mathematics and computer science with university honors, and that was just the beginning of her so far really outstanding career. Um, she's been at University of Utah as a professor um, almost since she finished her, her degree, but she's also had visiting uh, research positions, visiting professor positions at USC, Information Sciences Institute, and at Johns Hopkins, and she's been a major contributor to work on information extraction from text, for processing text to pull out structured information from the unstructured information that's out there on the web. So, very pleased. Great, thanks. inviting me to Santa Cruz. I'm very happy to be here. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is some work that we've done on trying to automatically generate plot unit representations for narrative stories. Um, this is joint work with Ahmed Goyle and Hal Domey, who were at the University of Utah when this work was done a few years ago. They have now moved to the University of Maryland. I'm going to try to keep this talk at a fairly high level. Um, um, if you want more details about the text analysis, feel free to go to some of the papers about this work that I have, which are on my webpage. But the basic idea here is that plot units were developed about 30 years ago now, a long time ago, as a representation for how people understand narrative stories and the plots between different characters in a story. And they were really a very innovative approach to representing plots because in contrast to thinking about a plot as just a sequence of actions that happen in the world, um, the idea here was that that's all, not all that matters. A central part of understanding a plot and what makes a plot interesting is thinking about how these events in the world affect the different characters, whether people are in a good state or a bad state because something happened, and their emotional reactions to events, and also the emotion, emotional interactions between the characters. And nobody had ever, ever modeled that sort of affect, thinking about emotions and positive and negative world states on characters before. So, um, in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that Wendy Leonard was my PhD advisor, so I'm not an unbiased uh, uh, person here. But part of the reason I wanted to work with her way back was because I thought this was some of the best work ever done in text analysis. Really different and really the right way that I think you, you need to think about text analysis for narrative stories. Um, the problem was, and the reason why this work kind of stopped way back, is that in the original days they needed massive amounts of manual, manually encoded knowledge. They literally would have people just putting world knowledge into the computer for months on end just to understand, say, a single story. And so it really wasn't practical back then to be able to automatically generate these for arbitrary stories. So that's what motivated this work. What I wanted to do is kind of see today, um, natural language processing technology has improved a lot in 30 years. And I wanted to see where we are today. Can we make any progress towards automatically generating these nice, rich, deep representations of language and meaning uh, for narrative stories? So, so there's three goals behind this work. Um, one is what I just said, just understanding the capabilities and limitations of human language technology today uh, for this problem. But we also wanted to, to try to think about decomposing this task. What are the sub-problems here? that really need to be solved to build these deeper representations. And the hope is if we can identify different subtasks, then maybe we can start tackling these different subtasks individually and make progress on, on generating these richer representations. And we also wanted to manually look at what type of world knowledge is needed in theory to generate these representations. So I'll spend a fair amount of time today just talking about our manual analysis of what it would take to be able to generate uh, these things sort of perfectly. 
So here's the outline of the talk today. First, I'll just explain what populas are. I'm assuming most people um, haven't heard of them before. Uh, just a brief definition and overview of, you know, with some examples. And then I'll talk about the knowledge that we think is necessary based on our <coughs> annual analysis to really be able to generate these things in theory. Um, then I'll move on and talk about our system called ASOC. The name for that will become, why it's named that will become apparent in a few minutes and, and explain to you how that works. Along the way, during, during this research, we realized that there's one type of knowledge, uh, knowledge about verbs that represent actions and which actions are good or bad for people, that we just didn't have in our current language processing resources. So we took a little tangent and spent some time trying to automatically learn those types of verbs and whether they represented positive or negative states. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we tried to generate those verbs and show whether they helped or not. Uh, I'll finally just talk about how well this all worked in the end and, and conclude with some of the lessons that we learned from this project. So what are plot units? They better be good now, right, with all that, with all that lead up. Um, so plot units were, were generated a long time ago, like I said, as a way to think about the way we encode stories in our memory, a form of memory organization, memory representation with ties to psychology, really. Um, and the central hypothesis here was that in order for a plot to be interesting and compelling, we need to understand the emotional reactions of characters to events and the emotional tensions between characters in the story. Okay, so um, that's really the key idea that you should keep in mind throughout this talk. And a fundamental aspect of plot units, too, is that they are a bottom-up mechanism. Okay, so in contrast to something like a story grammar, which would be a top-down mechanism, where you've got some, some structure and expectations that are guiding your understanding of a story, um, bottom-up approaches have no predictive expectations. Okay, they're sort of grown from the bottom up organically. You start creating smaller and smaller structures based upon what you actually see in the story, and then you put those into a big graph that is computed dynamically as the story is read. Okay? And what this produces is a much more flexible architecture that can allow for all different kinds of combinations of affect based upon what you see in the story. Okay. So at the, at the lowest level of all of this, there are what are called affect states. And this work was not really meant to do a deep characterization of emotion or world states. It was very simple that every character is either in a positive state, meaning that something happened that is good for the character, or in a negative state, something happened that's bad for the character, or a neutral state. Okay, but the neutral states that were, that were relevant here are some sort of what was called a mental state, which really represents the character has a plan or a goal to achieve something. Okay, otherwise, we don't care if they're just sitting around staring at the wall. Okay, so mental state you kind of think about as a character having a plan or a goal. And an important thing to keep in mind here, too, is that a single event can produce different affect states for different characters, okay? Because it can affect different characters in different ways. So, for example, if I say that John stole $100 from George, presumably this is bad for George, right? but good for John. John wanted to steal this money, and he succeeded. Okay? So the single robbery event produces different affect states for different characters. From the affect states, we build up to another level of representation, which were called primitive plot units. Okay. And this is just a pair of the affect states, ordered chronologically in time as the story progresses, among the same character. Okay. So a character transitions from one active affect state to a different affect state in time. And then there's a link, called a causal link, that connects the first affect state with the second affect state. And there are actually 15 different combinations that were allowed in this theory for the, what are called these primitive plot units. So the four kinds of links are a motivation link, which means that being in a certain state motivated an M state, a plan or a goal. Okay, so something bad happened to you that motivated a goal, maybe to find a solution to the problem, or something good happened to you that motivated a goal. So maybe you won the lottery and then decide you're going to plan a year-long vacation. There's also an A-link, 
which happens when you, you start in an M state, you've got a planner goal, and that leads to a positive or negative state. So your planner goal was actualized, it became real. It either succeeded, leads to a positive state, or it failed and leads to a negative state. The third type of link is called termination, and that's when you start in one affect state, um, and then there's a subsequent affect state that means that first one no longer exists. Okay, so maybe you have some problem that gets resolved, or you have one M state that is terminated by another M state, like you changed your mind. You had one goal, and then later in time you have a different goal. Okay. And then the last one is an equivalence link, which is basically just for more complex events where you can have multiple types of things spawning off of the same sort of event. So these two different M states, both two different sub-goals that sort of came about from the same initial event. Okay, so here's three examples of how these might look. Okay, there's actually, again, 15 different primitive plot units. These are just three of the examples. But if you've got an M state followed by a plus state with an actualization link between them, that's what's called a success plot unit. Okay, you had some planner goal, you achieved that planner goal, and that's what the A link means. Okay, so maybe you asked for a raise and then you get it, or you had a flat, um, you had a flat tire and then you got it fixed or you needed a car, so you steal one. Another primitive plot unit is uh, called a problem combination. So you start in some sort of a negative state, okay, and that motivates the M-link some sort of a plan or goal. Okay, so maybe you get fired, that's not good, but you decide you're going to apply for new jobs now. Or your sink clogs up, so you hire a plumber, or your dog dies, so you decide that you're going to go adopt a new thing. Uh, the, the question is, wouldn't the, like getting fired be moving to negative state and then and then deciding to apply for the job be the negative to M? Or am I just over and So the oops. The um the getting fired here we interpret as a bad event. Yeah, so like wouldn't that be going from like something else to negative? Is that um, what you're saying? Well, in this particular sentence, that's the first thing that happens. Okay. So it probably, there was probably something before it in the story. Yeah. I'm just starting from that point. Okay. Yes. Okay, and then the third example I'll show you is a motivation plot unit. So that's where a character has one mental state, one planner goal, that leads to another planner goal. Okay, and the first one motivates the second. So that's common in some sort of a sub-goaling situation. Okay, so you have some overarching goal, and then you figure out a sub-goal to try to solve that. So um, you need advice, so you call a friend. Um, you want to buy a car, so you apply for a loan. You really want to be a singer, so you sign up for singing lessons. Now there are also links between different characters. All those plot units I showed you before work in the same character. But an important aspect of stories is linking the reactions of different characters. I'm not going to say a whole lot about these. Um, but just to, so you understand that there are these different links across characters too that might say that um, a plan for one character related to a plan of another character or something bad happened to one character that motivated a different character. So for example, if um, a man just faints in the middle of the street and a woman goes to get help, but the bad thing that happened to the man motivated the, the, the different character to go get help. Okay, so there's all these different links that can be tied into. So here's a little story to show you how this comes together to represent stories. Um, very short little story, but this is one from the original applying this paper 30 years ago. Uh, when John tried to start his car this morning, it wouldn't turn over. Okay, so, so far we have a single character, John, and John is in a bad state, car won't start. Okay, so just one epic state uh, right now. So right away, I want you to think about this for a minute and realize that there's no emotion stated in this story at all. Okay. The only thing we're told is that his car won't start. But in our shared universe, most of us would probably recognize that if your car doesn't start, that's not good. Okay. So John's in a problem situation, but this is very difficult for natural language processing systems to have that knowledge and recognize this. Okay. So that's why it's an interesting problem from my perspective. The next sentence says that he asked his neighbor Paul for help. 
Okay, so this represents a plan. He's got a problem, he needs a plan. And you can see here, we've got that little problem plot unit starting to show up here. Okay, he had a problem, it motivates him to try to solve it, and his plan is to get Paul to fix his car. Okay, and so we now have a shared link across characters where he asks Paul if Paul will start the car. So now Paul has a plan too, which is to try to fix the car. The rest of the story then says that Paul did something to the carburetor and got it working and now everything's good. Okay. So what that means is that Paul's plan worked. He was able to fix the car. So this is a little success plot unit. Okay, that plan was actualized in a good way. It succeeded. And Paul's success means that John's plan worked. Okay. And so John's little plan here was also successful. That's another success plot unit. So we've got a problem plot unit, a success plot unit, another success plot unit. And then to fully understand the story, we need to know that the problem is resolved. So this positive state of the car working terminates the original state where the car doesn't work. Okay. And this whole notion of problem resolution is very important to plots. So this should hopefully feel kind of satisfying to you that this captures why this story is interesting to the extent that it is interesting. Right? It's obviously a simple story. Okay, so that's um, the 30,000 foot view of what plot units are. If you're interested in plot units, there's a lot more to read about in some of the original papers, but hopefully that gives you the general idea. So for our work, we decided to start working with Aesop's fables to see if we could generate plot unit representations for these fables. And Aesop's fables were particularly appropriate for this task because they're short. They tend to be focused on a narrative story because there's a moral usually at the end. And they have relatively few number of characters. So we thought these were the right place to start. Um, if we can't do Aesop's fables, we're probably not going to be able to do more difficult types of texts. But these are not easy by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there are all sorts of characters that are animals, <laughs> which is not, you know, animals are anthropomorphized and doing all sorts of things that animals don't usually do, for example. And, and there's plenty of long sentences in these fables, so it's still, it's still challenging text to work with. We found 34 from a website that just had a big database of Aesop's fables, selected ones that had a plot, which was most of them, but there were a few that only had morals, so we throw those away, and, and, and fables that only had uh, exactly two characters, which again was most of them. We use 11 for just developing our system, 8 is a tuning set, and then 15 we set aside for evaluation purposes. So all the results I'll show you are on those 15. And then we sat down, the three of us working on this, and spent a couple months actually putting a lot of labels manually on the text so we could evaluate our system, how well our system was doing. Okay. We manually generated the plot unit graph for each of these stories. We also kept track of the provenance for each affect state. So which clause in the original story did it come from? So we could kind of see what kind of phrases spawn these different affect states. And I'll talk more in a minute about this part, which is we also hypothesize what kind of world knowledge the computer would need in theory to be able to perfectly generate these affect states. Okay, and the last thing we did was generate perfect co-reference chains. These fables have a lot of pronouns that are very difficult to figure out which character they're referring to for the computer. And so to kind of factor that out, uh, we just annotated these by hand. Although we'll also, um, we also did an analysis of incorporating an automated approach as well. So as I said in the beginning, one of my personal goals in doing this research was to try to really understand what world knowledge the computer needs, in theory, to be able to generate these perfectly. Okay, what knowledge do we need to somehow endow our computers with? So we did this manual analysis to try to, to think about that. And for the positive and negative states, we came up with three categories that, that really seemed to dominate. Um, there were some states that come from direct expressions of emotion. Okay? So we'll see a sentence like, Mary was happy, it tells us that she's in a happy state, or Mary was sad, she's in a negative state. Okay, those are the simplest cases. We have a lot of, of good tools in NLP to do that kind of thing. Unfortunately, as I'll show you later, they're actually relatively rare, okay, but they do occur sometimes. The second case was very common, and these were situational knowledge. Okay, so just knowing that certain actions in the world are good or bad if they happen to you. Okay, this is very difficult for the computer. These are actual cases from real fables. 
We had a fable about an eagle, I think, or no, it was a wolf. The wolf had a bone stuck in his throat. He's in a bad state. We all know that. That's a lot of world knowledge for the computer to figure that out. Okay. Or we had a fable with a woman who was blind and then recovered her sight. So again, the computer needs to know that recovering eyesight is a good thing. And then the third type of knowledge was completion of a plan or goal. So if you had some plan and that plan worked, you should be in a good state. If it didn't work, you should be in a bad state. This also requires a lot of world knowledge because you need to know not only what the plan was, but whether a solution, potential solution, worked or not. Okay, so um, if a friend extracted the bone from his throat, you need to know that the extraction of the bone means it's no longer stuck. Okay. Uh, and there are other cases, many other cases like this too. For the M states, the plan or goal states, um, we also identified three kinds of knowledge that we think are behind the generation of these states. One are speech acts. So for those of you who don't know about speech acts, they're, they're communication between characters essentially, usually where you're requesting something of another person or issuing an invitation or making a commitment to another person, those sorts of communicative acts. And we saw a lot of these in the fables. Okay, so John asked Mary for help. That represents a plan on the part of John or Susan promised to drive George to work. Sometimes you get lucky, and the fable tells you very explicitly this is so-and-so's plan. Okay? So you will find sentences like, he wanted to get some money. Okay, so that's nice. It's a clear, explicit reference to a plan or goal. But there are also a lot of inferred plans or goals. These are really nasty, very challenging for the computer. You just use your world knowledge to infer that somebody had a plan or goal but you really need a lot of knowledge to figure that out. Okay, so if Mary put arsenic in John's coffee, there's probably a plan at work here. And think about how different that is from Mary put sugar in John's coffee. Putting sugar in John's coffee is not much of a plan. This is a fundamentally different kind of plan. And we'd see this kind of world knowledge all the time with the animals. A story might start off with the lion chased the antelope. Okay. They probably weren't playing tag. Okay. This represents a plan of the lion to eat the antelope, but that's a lot of world knowledge to go from, from chasing to understand that there's an eating plan here. So we then looked at the, the, how frequent these different types of knowledge were in our fables. It's a small set of fables, so um, you, know, you have to sort of extrapolate from a small amount of data. But basically, for the positive and negative states, over half of them, 61% of them, were plan goal completion. 36% came from these situational verbs, usually, and only 4% of them were clear statements of emotion. Okay, so there's a lot of world knowledge that we're going to need to do this well. And for the mental states, the plans and goals, um, oops, got my new pointer I'm getting used to, the, um, over half of them were inferred. Okay, about a third of them were speech acts and only 15% of them were stated explicitly. So, very challenging stuff for, for language people. But we did go ahead and build a system to try to do this, and I'll show you how well it worked at the end. Um, as I mentioned before as well, one of our goals was, was to try to decompose the problem into subtasks. Because generating a big plot unit graph is a big daunting task. How could we break that down into smaller tasks? And we broke it down into four steps. Uh, here, and I'll tell you how they work one at a time. Affect state recognition, character identification, affect state projection, and then finally, creating the links. So to recognize the affect states, what we started off doing was simply using existing resources. There are a lot of dictionaries available now in language technology circles, and we looked at a lot of possibilities and found five that we thought might be particularly useful. So we tried these five. One of them is FrameNet which contains a lot of words, especially verbs for us, that um, Amit Goyle, who, who worked on this with us, spent a lot of time looking at these different categories of verbs and found a lot of them that he thought corresponded to good or bad types of events, and also a bunch that corresponded to plans or goals. Okay, so he found uh, 43 different categories of verbs that had 343 words associated with them. Uh, we ended up with 117 positive words and 287 negative words. And these are mostly verbs. 
We also found a big list of verbs corresponding to speech acts, things like requests and invitations, commitments, that sort of thing. We use those. And then there are a lot of resources for basically emotion analysis in text. So we use these. We found dictionaries of positive and negative emotion words from two different sources, and also um, a little tagger that went, goes along, reads a sentence, and assigns labels to words. And it's, there are also some more speech act types of words being recognized by that as well. Okay, so we just use these existing tools off the shelf to figure out what words seem to correspond to good or bad events or plans of good. The second step was character identification. I'm not going to say a lot more about this because all the results I'll show you today were on the manually labeled character identification. But we did have an automated system too that did some rule-based identification of pronouns. So if you see he or she, who is it referring to? Again, this is particularly challenging because a she may refer to an owl or an antelope or a lion. <laughs> and uh, that was very hard for the automated system. So we just did a little rule-based thing to, to do a decent job at that. The third step is probably the most interesting one and, and where we had to really do some new things. So the issue here is that you've got mostly verbs but also some adjectives and adverbs that we say, okay, these are positive or negative things that happened. But who did they happen to? Okay, that sounds really easy. It's not so easy from the computer's perspective. So who was in a positive state here? Who was in a negative state? Who was the one who has the plan or goal? And what we realized is that we could utilize the syntactic structure to make some pretty good guesses about this. Okay. So we call this affect state projection because we have a word, often a verb, that we say, okay, this was a good or bad thing that happened, and we need to project that onto one of the characters in the story. Okay. So we use the output of the character identifier to know, to know which characters were mentioned in the clause and where they were syntactically. And then we use the verb argument structure to try to figure out which character gets which label. There's a big assumption here for those of you who know anything about NLP that the subject of the verb is an agent and the direct object is the patient. Um, I won't go into that anymore, but it worked pretty well in our system. So there were four heuristics here. Two of them are really simple. So the first one says if you've got a verb and there's an agent, but there's no patient, so no, nothing that was being acted upon, well, it must be the agent that gets the affect state. Okay, so if you see a sentence like Mary screamed, and you know screamed is a negative event, Mary gets the negative event. Okay. The other case is equally simple, and it's the reverse where you've got a verb, but there's someone who was acted upon, but no, no agent, no actor. So this is a case, usually passive voice, like John was thrilled. Okay. So now we're going to assume that, well, it must be John. There's no other character appearing here. If we know thrilled is a good thing, John must be the person in the good state. The next two were a little more complex, not terribly complex, but this is also what kind of makes it interesting. We had to think about, suppose you have two characters surrounding a verb. Okay, so you've got an agent, an actor, a verb, and also someone who was acted upon. What happens here? And what we realized is really it's the character who was acted upon who was on the receiving end of the action. So if it was a good action, that person's in a good state. If it was a bad action, that person is in a bad state. So if we see something like the cat killed the mouse, and we think killing is not a good thing, then it must be the mouse who's in a bad state because the mouse is the one that was killed. If there's a plan or goal associated with that verb, then we say, well, that plan or goal started with one character but ended with the other. And so both of them, in some sense, this is a speech act situation usually, where there's a request or something like that, and one character issues the request and the other character receives it. So both of them, in that case, get the, the plan and goal state. And then the fourth case is where we've got a more complex kind of verb situation that includes an infinitive structure. So something like the cat tried to kill the mouse. Okay, so this is an infinitive structure here with that two in front of the verb. And what we did is break this into two cases. For the first verb, any affect sitting on this one goes to the cat, and any affect sitting on the patient, the mouse, um, sorry, any affect sitting on the kill goes to the patient, the mouse. Okay. So those worked pretty 
well. We were pretty happy with most of the affect states that got rejected using those rules. But we noticed we were missing a lot. Like, where are these other affect states coming from? Why are we missing so many? And we realized that there's a fair amount of inference that comes about from syntactic structure as well. So we added two more rules that are purely inference rules that, are, that are come from the syntactic form of the sentence. Um, so here's the first case. Okay, it's this case again, you've got a verb, and there's two characters, both an, an actor and someone who's acted upon. So the cat killed the mouse. Well, the situation here is that there's an actor who did something, the cat. And the assumption is, most of the time, the actor did this intentionally. Okay, it's a rare situation where they were coerced, coerced to do something. Usually it was an intentional action. And so they did something, and presumably they wanted to do it. And so we're going to put them in a positive state because they accomplished this action. Okay. So the cat would also be judged to be in a positive state because presumably he wanted to kill the mouse, and this statement is past tense and sounds like he did that. The second case is... Um, oops. The second case is that infinitive structure again, and the, the two verb, the cat tried to kill the mouse, that fundamentally means that's what they were trying to do. There's a plan there. Okay. And so we'll also say, okay, not only is the mouse in a bad state here, because somebody tried to kill him, but also we're going to infer that the cat had a plan. Okay. And so that, just that syntactic structure of the infinitive means that we infer an M state for the actor representing their plan, their goal. Okay, and then the last step in this whole big system is link creation. And honestly, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on this. We just tried some simple cases to kind of capture the most common situations that we found to see how far that would get us. Um, and there were two really common cases that we were able to, to use heuristics to do. One is a cross-character link. So basically, if we had um, two different characters that received affect states that originated from the same word. Okay, so something like uh, the boy invited the girl to the party. Okay. The invitation yields an M state for both the boy and the girl. And so we'll say, okay, there's some connection between the characters here. And then the causal links which exist between the same character, chronological states between the same character, we just created a link for every pair of chronological affect states for the same character. Okay, so this is a very exhaustive approach just to capture the things that happen consecutively in time. There are also links that can have longer distance connections and we didn't try to do those at all in this initial line of work. Okay. So we only generated these M and the A states. We're leaving the T and the E links for later work because they're uh, quite a bit more complicated. So how well did this work? Well, these are the results of the, of the uh, just recognizing the affect states on the characters. So this is the recall, which means how many of them did we find, and precision is how accurate were we when we actually generated them. Did we generate a lot of false hits or not? And using just those five original resources that I mentioned earlier. And the bottom line here is that frame net works by far the best using these different subcategories of verbs that we found. We were able to find about a third, 29%, of the affect states using just frame net, and about 51% precision. So the accuracy is still far from perfect, but given how challenging this task was, that was actually okay precision in terms of what we were expecting. The other resources, um, they helped also. They found a bunch of things, but their accuracy especially the emotion resources, was quite a bit lower. The speech act list actually had pretty decent accuracy as well, um, but almost everything that it found, FrameNet also found. So when we combined them together, we didn't really get much of an additional boost. Okay, and that's what you see here is trying FrameNet combined with the other things. Um, usually the accuracy just got dragged down by the other resources and it didn't really add enough recall to make up for that difference. So in the end, the bottom line is we just use frame net. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah, one question about precision. Well, how many precision reference FN plus speech end up being lower than the combined? That's weird to me. 
You mean the one on the bottom? Yeah. Um, yeah, that is a little weird. I think the, the issue here is that um, it's, there are all these projection rules that can spawn additional states based on syntactic structure, and sometimes those make mistakes. So it's not just the positive states coming from these words, but also some of those inferred states can be wrong. So that's what happened. Okay, um, another line of work that we did sort of in the middle of this um, was motivated by the fact that we realized, I mean, we can look back at these results for a second and say, well, we're missing an awful lot of affect states. Our recall is only 29%. What are we missing? And we realized that we're missing a lot of these situational states that come from world knowledge about verbs that are good or bad if they happen to you. And there were no existing resources in the field that captured this knowledge that I know of. Okay? So for example, if you're eaten, not good for you. If you're blamed for something, if you're captured or hospitalized or, or fired, you're probably not in a positive state, right? pretty negative state. On the other hand, if you're fed or adopted or paid or rescued or promoted or hired or tenured, right? these are all good things, usually. You're happy. You're in a good state. Okay. But these the words themselves don't carry emotion. These are just actions in the world. You're eating. That's not emotional. Um, being adopted, that's not emotional. Being paid, that's not emotional. So we needed knowledge about which of these world states were good or bad for people. And we set off to try to learn these automatically using bootstrapping techniques. So I've done a lot of work on bootstrapping methods. And the general idea is you start with a lot of raw text that's not labeled in any way, use a few examples, and then try to get the system to automatically learn more and more. So we came up with two ideas, really simple ideas, to just see if we could learn some of these verbs automatically. And the first idea was, came from an observation that other people have made about adjectives, which is that if you've got a conjunction of adjectives, usually they're either both positive or both negative. Or you'll say that they're happy and excited. You don't usually say that they're happy and disappointed. And we hypothesize the same thing is true for verbs, abducted and killed. They're both negative or rescued and rehabilitated, both positive. You can always find exceptions, but on the whole, conjoining things with the same affect is much more common than conjoining things with different affects. So we had an existing bootstrapping algorithm that can automatically learn words, and we tried using that to try automatically learning verbs that have a certain affect, positive or negative. And the way this works, oh, and for those of you who don't know, I got asked about this yesterday. The name of the system is Basilisk. Oops. Um, and it actually is not just the big monster, but also a little lizard that's very cute. Okay. <laughs> so that's what the little icon is. <laughs> so the way the bootstrapping works is you start with a large amount of unstructured text, not labeled in any way, and then a few examples that a person gives you for what you're trying to learn. So in our case, maybe we'd start off by trying to learn positive verbs. Okay, that, that are good for the, whoever's acted upon. So we might give it 10 examples, that's what we did, of things like rescued, rehabilitated, promoted, and paid, and say these are good verbs. And then we told it to use conjunction patterns. Okay, so we used, uh, there's a huge, I think it's a terabyte worth of engrams that Google has made available for people to use. We used this giant collection of engrams and just looked for these conjunction patterns that contained one of those seed words. And then we ran this existing algorithm that we had that looks at the statistics and, and ranks some new words that it thinks are good candidates that behave very similarly to the seed words. Okay. So it finds, say, the 10 best words that have the highest scores. And hopefully they are also positive words like saved or adopted or honored or hired or praised. You add those to your list automatically. And then you start the whole bootstrapping process again now that you have more examples that you can also use for learning. Okay, and this thing iterates over time. So that's the first approach that we tried. These are uh, the output generated almost 700 negative verbs, not nearly as many positive verbs, although they were pretty good, the ones it produced. And these are just the top 20 most highly ranked words that it found. You can get a sense of the kind of things it found. There's some part of speech tagging errors in there, obviously, but um, most of them were pretty good. And more importantly, it generated a lot of, of verbs that we didn't have in any of our previous lists. Okay, so 
It learned that being censored or chased or fired or orphaned or paralyzed or scared or sued, those are all bad things to happen to you. On the other hand, if you're accommodated, if you're harbored, if you're nursed, obeyed, respected, valued, those are all good things to happen to you. We also tried a second technique, also very simple, using the same n-gram corpus that's available from Google. And we looked for verbs that co-occur with stereotypically evil agent words or stereotypically kind agent words. So there's lots of words. Actually, when you start thinking about it, it's kind of fun. There's a lot of words that refer to people with evil intentions. Okay, so words like monster or villain or terrorist or, or sniper, assassin, all these sorts of words. Um, witch is another one. And there's also words, you have to think a little harder, but they exist, um, that refer to people with good intentions, like angel or benefactor or hero, things like this. Okay. So we looked in these engrams for patterns of the form verb by evil agent, something happened and was performed by an evil agent, or verb by a kind agent. Okay, so that's basically just saying what I just said. Okay. This process produced over 800 negative verbs and over four, uh, almost 1,400 positive verbs. Okay. And many of these negative words were not in our ex external list. So this was by far the best list of negative words that we had. The positive words turned out to be very noisy. There are a lot of neutral words in there too. So we didn't use the positive words uh, generated by the process. Here's what happened when we added them to the system. So we had 29% recall before. And that jumped to 41% recall with only a very small drop in precision. So it really helped us find a lot of affect states that we weren't able to recognize before. And that's just using the evil words, sorry, the, the negative verbs produced by the evil agent trick. Okay. We used the positive words generated by basilisk because they were pretty good, and that gave us a few more points of recall finding some of the, the good events. So here are the overall evaluation results, too, to kind of take a step back and look at the overall system that we had. Um, our baseline system just used FrameNet and those verbs that we learned automatically. But we took out the projection rules and said, well, do those projection rules actually help or not? Right, because we spent a lot of time thinking about those. And it turns out if you take out the projection rules and you just exhaustively assign every state to every character in the same clause, you only get about half the precision. Okay. So the projection rules helped us increase the precision from 24 to 48. Uh, with almost the same recall, we really didn't lose much by using them. Okay, so clearly those projection rules were, were helpful as well. And then we did a final experiment just showing, well, these did assume the presence of perfect character identification for the co-reference resolution. What if you put an automated system in there? This was not the best automated system in the world. It was a little rule-based system that we created for this task. Um, but you can see it, it didn't work all that well. We definitely take a hit. So I think this is uh, an area that needs to be improved in the future as well. The other thing we wanted to take a look at now is, is looking at what our system did. How well did we find those different categories of knowledge that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk? Okay. So we have these different kinds of knowledge that these affect states should come from. What were we actually able to find? So remember I said that the positive states, positive and negative states, come from emotion expressions, situational verbs, and the completion of a plan or goal. And what we found, if you just look at the bottom row here, is that we were able to find, in the best case, 53% of those situational verbs. But that's largely because of these verbs we learned. So FrameNet itself originally only found 13% of them. By learning those positive and negative verbs, we were able to increase that to 43%. And then some of those inference rules we had from the projection added another 10%. So we were able to find about half of them. So that was quite good. Plan goal completion, less good. We only found about a third of them. And we didn't find any of the emotion states, but there were only three. And, and we intentionally threw away the emotion resources because their accuracy wasn't that high. So there would be ways to probably get them back if we spent more time with that. But they're just relatively rare. That's not really the heart of the problem here. For the M states, we said that they could have originated from three types of knowledge. 
Um, speech acts were really quite common, and we did a very good job with those. That was the happiest part of the story. We found 68% of them. So NLP technology can do a pretty good job at recognizing speech acts, which is important. But we only found about a third of the explicit plans or the inferred plans. Okay, so this suggests what is needed for future work. We really want to do a better job at generating quite unit representations. As a community, we need to spend more time trying to recognize plans and goals um, in language and sentences. So my conclusion here is there's both positive and negative aspects of this work. Um, on the good side, we did build a system that automatically generates these polyunit graphs. And that was, uh, I think, uh, I feel somewhat satisfied in the fact that we were able to do that. And we did find quite a few affect states fully automatically. Okay? And we had particularly good performance, I think, on the speech acts. And through the learning of those patient polarity verbs, we ended up with decent performance on recognizing these situational states. There's more work to be done there, but definitely progress has been made. The projection rules also seem to work reasonably well, being able to, to figure out which character deserve the different affects. But there's plenty of work to be done here. Still, this performance is uh, plenty of room for improvement. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on recognizing plans and goals in language. Um, linking different affect states together, we have very simple heuristics in there. Um, and there's more work to be done there. Co-reference resolution obviously needs to be improved, um, not just for this problem, but language analysis in general. And I'll also just mention that you know, there are some sentences where it's pure inference. There's just a whole lot of inference that you need to figure out what's going on. Uh, something like, you know, um, John put arsenic right, in so-and-so's coffee. But also we had a sentence like, um, the lion saw the antelope. And that's it. From that, you were supposed to figure out that the lion's eventually going to eat the antelope. Okay. A lot of world knowledge there that needs to be captured. So, so there's a lot of work to be done. And for those of you interested in, in text analysis, I think um, thinking about trying to recognize plans and goals is definitely something worth thinking about. So with that, I'll take any questions that you all have. Thanks.